Hi there, I'm Ron Sisko. I'm with the uh, Salt River Project. Um, what we're going to talk about today is our uh, experiences with building a high fidelity simulation system, where we are today and kind of where we hope to get to in the future. Everybody always asks me, I'm surprised how few people know who Salt River Project is. We were actually one of the first um, uh, of the five uh, approved dams from the original New Lands Federal Reclamation Project. Uh, we're on integrated power and water utility. Uh, you can kind of see that there. Um, interesting thing on our first dam um, that we built is Roosevelt Dam, named after Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, 1909 it was completed. It had 825 hertz of generators that actually weren't replaced until the early 70s. Um, frequency was all over the place back in those days. Okay. We built it at Coronado Generating Station. Uh, SRP owns 100% of that station. We can push 773 megawatts down the line. Uh, we've done extensive environmental controls upgrades through the years. Uh, we had original precips. We have 100% full flow absorbers, low NOx burners. We use calcium bromide uh, and carbon injection for mercury control. We have a SCR in one of our units, and we also utilize uh, combustion optimization systems for emissions controls. Okay, our original simulation was included as part of a DCS upgrade migration project, which is always the biggest challenge when, when you're trying to justify a simulation. Uh, for us, it was a little easier because we knew at the time that we were, we were going to upgrade the DCS. We knew we were going to change the graphics. At the same time, we had uh, we knew that most of our operators were going to go down the road. Um, it was, uh, so it was easier for us to justify it. We have a SimSide dynamic simulation. We have a, a high fidelity simulation for the process model for, uh, for one of our units, uh, the absorber and the auxiliaries. Uh, we have DCS, IA DCS controls emulated, our Triconics uh, turbine controls emulated in tri So it, It's funny, I always like to point this out because this, these were the Honeywell TDC 3000 graphics, and then this is the modern, more modern IA graphics. And they're, they're very, very similar, but you would be very surprised at when you get an operator uh, looking at these and sitting in front of a console that this leads to vapor lock. Right? They look at this and it's like the same components, you've still got auto manual stations which are there, you've still got start and stop buttons, but making small changes that eye memory that you've developed over the years um, is different and um, it's really hard to uh, to keep those guys uh, understanding okay it's doing the same thing so uh, the simulator really helped us out there on our original projects kind of our bragging rights we have at the same time we we also commissioned the absorber on the unit we found 144 control issues this was after the factory acceptance test for the controls checkout uh, we did get those resolved it helped us a lot with recognizing alarm flood events, getting most of our nuisance alarms kind of taken care of. That's an ongoing battle uh, continuously, uh, but we did get the bulk of them out of the way at least by doing the simulator testing. Um, we also used it to develop many of our control strategies and information applications. It's a generator temperature monitor, uh, uh, turbine starter program, etc. Everyone always asks, you know, how do we quantify if this thing has a return on investment? Um, it's really hard to say, well, this didn't happen because we found these control logic errors, so this didn't blow up. So, well, we might have found it another way, right? So we can't, with any kind of confidence, say, okay, well, sure, we found it on the simulation, but we could have found it in the real world as well. Um, so the one thing that we did, everyone started saying at the time we were building the project, our project manager and managers all around us, uh, that became the common thing. This thing just paid for itself. Uh, so that's all we've got on that, right, <laughs> as far as finances. Um, we did save a, a lot of time with uh, HMI development. We also saved, uh, we, we built some uh, testing applications and things that saved us a lot of time on the testing that we do on a yearly basis. Okay, originally we did four days of training for the existing supervisors and operations specialists. What that did for us was multifold. We, um, at the same time we were doing it, you know, they suggested improvements for the HMI. We also saw the, uh, uh, the, of course, the control errors, and we basically told them to break it. You know, it's like you set them down there and, and we're going through a startup or a shutdown or we're throwing excursions at them. Um, we're like, you know what, you know, break the thing. Make it, you know, make it blow something up, you know, bust a line, break a motor. 
And, uh, and as we saw those issues coming up, or we saw them running into situations where they didn't know what to do or, or they didn't know which graphic to go to, we saw where we needed improvement. Um, the end result of that was we actually had no startup delays due to operator error and no startup delays due to DCS logic on our first startup uh, with a DCS migration project. Okay, so today, um, here we are. Modeling is obviously the core and heart of the simulation. Uh, with ours, it has kind of a PID layout. You set parameters over here. Um, in the simulation world, everything's about fidelity and how realistic can we make, how much can we replicate the actual process um, out there in the real world. Uh, for ours, it's mostly high fidelity. We have some medium fidelity, but mostly everything is uh, as close as we can. Our good change of that, if you can get a 25-year operator to sit there and sweat, you know you're doing a pretty good job, all right? Um, so. What we added later, uh, well, this was actually there originally. We just didn't really use it for much. Uh, we did have a trainer cabinet. It's like a little miniature control system that's sitting there. It's not necessary for the simulation, which is basically software-based, but we had it. And so we were like, okay, we've got to use this for something. So originally, you know, we are idea, okay, we can use it for instrument and electrical uh, training. We also use it now to configure our Cohen flame scanners. Um, but we thought, well, well, I was thinking at the time, well, there's got to be something else we can do with this. Because what you find is the older operators coming in kind of know what we're dealing with. They know the price of, of, of messing up, basically. Um, the new operators coming in, it's a newer generation. They're used to playing video games. You don't want them sitting down on a simulation system and saying, and treating them like a video game, right? It's like, oops, I messed up. Okay, try again. Well, you can't do that in the real world. And that's the last thing we want them to do, is to be out there doing that. So I thought, okay, we can use this for that. So this was the most fun I had. They shouldn't have paid me for it. Uh, uh, building this. Basically what we did is I tried to find ways to to integrate real-world objects into the simulation so it wasn't just software that they're dealing with and the most effective way to get an operator's attention is just to scare the hell out of them you know and uh, which is essentially what we did uh, you know we've got an air tank down here basically it's tied to our turbine air relay dump valve so if they mess up you know they trip the unit bam it blows here in their face and it's very loud and uh, it gets a rise out of them. And, it, and it's interesting because it's kind of funny and it, and it was always fun for me just to, you know, it's like you always want to mess with that guy, right? You know, if he's, but, but, but what was interesting with it is that every time that, that we did it, if a guy was not taking it seriously, if he was treating it like a video game, you know, you pop that thing in his face and uh, the next time, every time we're getting in a situation to where the unit's going south, this guy's worried. He's sweating. He's looking. He's like, oh, God, i got to get it. i got to fix it. You know? And uh, so it really did have some impact. At the same time, uh, I did, we did some uh, to tie it to the model with the EHC pumps and some of our turbine uh, controls just so we could kind of visualize uh, what was going on out there in the world. Okay, our current training program, uh, we do have a 120-hour OS school that they go through. When they cover classroom topics, the last two hours of every day are spent on the simulation. We just try to reinforce what they've learned uh, for the day in the classroom. There's 39 CPTs that they kind of do throughout their career, but they should technically be finished before they come. And we have a six-week simulator training program with 26 job performance measures that we put them through through the various systems. And this is what we were facing. You know, we had a trial by fire. This was a 2013 projection showing that pretty much half of our employees were eligible for retirement um, right now. And uh, that came to fruition from what we've seen. Currently, 80% of our control room operators were simulator trainees. Um, you could tell just by thinking back in the past, when I came up through the ranks, we didn't have a simulator. And I can think of myself being scared to death in front of that console. Um, and operating and not knowing what to do and uh, just trying to, you know, you just try to figure it out as you go and you hope you have people experienced around you. Uh, now they don't necessarily have that. They don't have the guy that's been there for 20 years to say, what do I do, you know? Um, so, so looking at them now coming out of the program, there is an increase in confidence uh, and the knowledge level that they do have. So just showing that in kind of a graph form, for average years experience, and this is kind of counting the supervisors. Supervisors have a little more experience. But looking at what happened here, we actually got the simulator here in 2010, we did the controls project in 2011, and people just started leaving. 
So we've actually dropped down to less than five years, like 3.6 years of average experience in our control rooms. And so when you get in that situation, you know, what do you expect? Well, essentially, this is what we expect. And can you push play on that? Yeah. So yeah, so luckily we didn't experience that as of yet. Looking at, at what actually happened out there, this is actually a history of every operator error related trip uh, combined on both of our units since our plant's inception. Back here, it, we were on an Old Bailey 620, a pneumatic system. You can see operator error rates were obviously higher. Uh, you had less refinement controls, you didn't have as many alarms, you just didn't have as much visibility as what was going on in the systems. In 1986, it took me a while to figure out what happened there, and I had to ask people, uh, that was before my time, so I was like, you know, what the hell happened? I mean, look at this, 20 operator, you know, and it turned out that was a time, uh, it was a, a time of transition for the industry, um, also through deregulation, this and that, so, but we also had six new control room operators that year, and that really shows you the impact of, of what happens when you just throw these guys in there. Um, with, the, and they had plenty of classroom training, they, but, you know, they didn't have simulation systems to play on at the time. They had some, but not the, with the fidelity that we have today. We did a Honeywell DCS migration here in 93, between 93 and 95. Uh, that was going from, it, it's not really fair to compare this to this, I guess, in a way. I have to be fair here, because going from uh, an analog system to a DCS is a little more challenging than going from one DCS to another. Right? But there was an increase in operator error rates in that time. Um, it was very clear. When we did the simulation here, at the same time as you saw on the other graph, um, our experienced operators were going away. Uh, so we lost the experience, we also went to a new control system, and we have seen no increase in operator error related load losses, which has really been a great thing for us, and it's, uh, that's how it's really proven itself. Going forward is more of a cultural thing, a cultural shift, to build an environment of continuous operator training and improvement. Our existing, the program that we're about to implement now, our existing control operators and our trainees will be rotating through a quarterly refresher. They'll spend eight hours um, with the simulation, kind of reviewing what's happened over time, if there's many mistakes so they can try. Um, that. But one of the greatest things about it is if you catch an operator making a mistake, um, you can take it back to the simulation and you can say, you know what, try again, you know, and try again, try again. And if you have good fidelity and if you take the time, to build your models such that it is very realistic. You can make them do it until they figure it out, and they do. You know, they'll, they'll figure it out and it just makes everyone better. We also are gonna do our supervisors twice a year, and obviously we have new OSTs. What I mean by this, the simulator needs a champion, is what I've found is that a lot of people don't understand. They think simulation, they're thinking steady state, they're thinking loopback models. They're thinking, you push start, it shows running, and it shows pressure and temperature on the line. Um, but simulators are not that way today. Today, simulation systems are full, high fidelity physical models based on, apl on applied physics that, that actually do a great job of mimicking the actual world. And there are a lot of things that you can do to improve that hysteresis and make it seem more and more realistic as time goes on if you continue to develop. We also saw the need to come up with more consistent ways to, you know, grade people, basically. So you're trying to decide, you know, when we originally did it, it was really just kind of up to me. I mean, we, we didn't have a way to, 
to say, okay, this person's passed, he's ready to go to the control room, and we'll just turn him loose. So what we did is we, we implemented a training performance monitor. It's just a zero to 100%. It, you, you can see here it uses weights. So you have some grace periods. Um, and then we define penalties that you play. We support these with scenarios that actually set the conditions up that you want them to run through. These are tied to each of those job performance measures um, as we go along to, um, to basically just see if they can pass and they can try over and over. This is a relatively new thing that we're trying and, and it appears to be working pretty well. And that's pretty much all I got. One thing I didn't talk about a lot was our DCS testing and development and the control application development is something that's ongoing and that we continually do. Every change that we want to make to the real world, we, we test on the simulation. And what we found is in 99.9% .9 of the cases, even with the tuning, um, what we end up with on the simulation is what we also end up putting in the real world and it just works. It saves us a lot of embarrassment when we're doing DCS development, but it also makes it to where we, we have more robust control systems that are better tested that we can feel confident about when we put them in the real world. Um, going into the future, we, there's one thing about modeling, you're always adding. Uh, with the industry in transition, especially being in a coal-fired power station, we're always changing things. We're always adding and trying to figure out ways to be more efficient for our emissions to be lower, uh, which that challenge gets larger and larger all the time. Um, it's one of the great benefits of this, and we're going to do more and more of that going into the future. Um, I know Rick talked a lot about immersive training simulators and 3D simulation. It's always been one of my dreams to do that. Um, I, I am a computer programmer. I came up a uh, game and simulation programming. Um, I actually have a little 3D engine that I built myself. I've always wanted to implement it, but it takes a lot of time, you know. It takes a lot of time to capture the world, even if we were just going to do this room. But technology today is making that a lot easier. Uh, you know, they have little cameras that sit on tripods that'll just take a snapshot and actually build the point clouds for you, and then you, you can take your pictures and, and make your things. So hopefully, you know, depending on, on our future and with the clean power plan and all this stuff coming up, it's hard to justify large projects uh, at a coal plant. So depending on how all that ends up, that'll be what we hope to, to achieve in the future. Uh, so and that's all I got.